Regarding Men, Episode 33, Why Men Are Happier Than Women. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Regarding Men. I think this is number 33, and today we're going to talk about Harry's Masculinity Report, USA 2018. Hmm. Harry's Masculinity Report. We're assuming this is Harry's Razors, is, is a paid a man named John Barry, who is a wonderful psychologist in Great Britain, who was involved, in fact, it was the leading force in creating a, a men's section of the British Psychological Association. So bless his heart. Anyway, Harry's asked John Barry to do this study on men and masculinity in the USA. And let me tell you something. This is what I would call a toxic masculinity killer because it looks at men in the USA, not about whether they're toxic, but about what are they interested in? What drives them? What motivates them? What are their values? And I'm telling you, this study is wonderful to read through. It's absolutely wonderful to read through. It's just, uh, it's an amazing piece. Um, let's start there. You know, the one of the things they did was the in the study they have a, one page that gives the 10 takeaways from this particular study. And I think one of the things we can do is go through a couple of those at least and look at them. In fact, now let me read just the first one, which I think encapsulates the rest of it. The modern American man is a moral man. Huh. First sentence, wow. modern American man is a moral man. When asked what characteristics he aspires to be, he chooses values that put the needs of others over his own. At the top were honesty, reliability, dependability, being respectful of others, and loyalty. And that's just the first one. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's just, to me, reading this was a shock. It was like, what? It was a male positive research piece that talked about men in really, really positive ways. And it was kind of hard to swallow in a way because I wasn't used to it. I was used to research studies being very negative about men or being halfway positive and but the, but the negative, you know? But this one was like all positive. It was like, what the? But what did you guys think of this? Where do we go from here? Well, I mean, I'm not surprised that many men would answer, if, if, I'm assuming what they did was survey work here. Yes, 5,000 different people were surveyed. And I'm not surprised at all that men name those as their values. Right, I mean, right. And I think we do have an, uh, a lot of bias that comes into surveys and different ways to read information. And so, and I'm not dismissing what was said because I believe, and I have a very easy time believing yes. that if you ask most men what your values are, what you find important, they would say honesty, integrity, honor, um, protectiveness, maybe generally very, very positive traits in that. Um, I think that if we ask the average men how much of those things have they sacrificed to women, that we would get possibly very different answers, maybe not consistent with that, but in their general lives, this makes perfect sense to me. What do you mean sacrifice to women, Paul? Well, my experience in, with men and with men who are honest, who talk about what their lives have really been about is, yeah. you know, for instance, men have a unfortunate tendency to sacrifice male friendships in order to please women, to abandon each other. Um, I forgot one poem I heard, you know, uh, a long time ago, uh, would you, my brother, throw me in the well um, regarding women? No. And this is, but this doesn't necessarily, this reflects how many men act out of gynocentrism. Right. But in their lives, generally speaking, yes, I think men value these things. And I think it's very unusual that a study would focus on that at all. Yes. Um, uh, it, it's actually quite incredible. It's wonderful. Absolutely yeah. wonderful to read through. Janice, what do you think? Yeah, I, it confirmed, you know, my sense of the men, you know, in my lives, their, their values. And, uh, and it was wonderful to see. I mean, so often it seems that these kinds of surveys or studies take 
aspects of men's lives or their, you know, attitudes and qualities, and then fit them into a particular schema, which allows the researcher to say, you know, that these are all, you know, to, to, to put them within a negative framework. So if men uh, report uh, enjoying taking risks and challenging themselves, that gets reinterpreted as a bad thing rather than a the, the multifaceted reality which has both positive and negative aspects to it that we know it really is and if men talk about enjoying competition and being driven by that and being driven to, the, to be the best that gets interpreted as an totally negative thing rather than again the an often positive sometimes negative depending on you know what, what context it, it's uh, it's activated in and so it was nice to, to, to see this positive study at, that that um, really emphasized the, the 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 values that we do see reflected in men's lives their their enjoyment and deep satisfaction that they take in meaningful work and in being able to provide for others to provide for their families being able to make a contribution to a particular company and therefore to the wider society that just rings so true yes yes me. yeah I was very impressed with that part too Janice yeah. Where they were talking about what was important to men. What was important to men was that they were a part of succeeding in a company. They were part of what helped the company to succeed and grow. Mm -hmm. And money was down on the list. You know, mm -hmm. the top of the list was was providing for a family. You know, that was a big one. And also, you know, being a part of a company that succeeds and being a part of that. Very different from what you yeah. see with all the greed talk. Oh, men are so greedy. You know, all they want is money, money, money. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I one of the things they, they brought up in this too uh, that we mentioned earlier before we started this was the relationship men have with winning and how most of the men in the survey apparently said they enjoyed the competition more than actual wins or losses. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much of that I buy and a lot of it comes into the ambiguity of the question too because what does winning mean? I, what, what I do see in men for, in sports, for instance, there's a sort of a code of honor about winning that you don't run up the score on an opponent. Once you've won, you don't add insult to injury. You don't keep your first string in once you're, you know, four touchdowns ahead in the fourth quarter. You put in- Belichick. <laughs> What's that? Belichick. <laughs> oh, Belichick, yes, of course. <laughs> Yes, there are exceptions. <laughs> Another exception I can think of is the women's USA soccer team. Yeah, who was yeah. Winning like crazy and jubilantly running up the score on their opponents and high-fiving each other through the whole thing. Um, I do think with men, I find it very credible that men, generally speaking, will not do this. Yes, that's a code of honor. It, there is an honor that they're not there to add insult to injury. Yes. They're there to try to win. And so in that light, I partially disagree with the results. I think men love to win. Uh, of course. I know I, uh, and it's part of what drives us is competition. Yes. We and love to win the girl. We love to win the game. Yes. Uh, that's how men operate. And what I got from what the study said was that they love to win in order to provide for the family. They love to win in order to provide for yep. the company. You know, yep. that that was the first on their list. And that is, rings true for me and the men that I know. You know, the other thing this damn thing said was that American men are happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did it say? American men are largely happy with an above average positive mindset index, PMI, and typically have a more positive outlook on life than men in the UK. Yeah. How about that? I know. I thought that was interesting, but we would love to hear the, uh, the numbers yeah. speculate too about why. I mean, maybe they wouldn't do that because maybe yes. it's possible it to would, speculate, but it's fascinating. It would be very good to see the numbers too, just to be able to know yeah. exactly well, the what the raw data says. A place where you can be thrown in jail for teaching your dog how to lift its paw. Maybe that has some, some <laughs> of the happiness going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There may be a, a close connection between freedom and happiness. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, amen. Just ask yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it, it, you know, the study is really a a, 
uh, a clear and decisively challenging response to all the negative reports, all the negative commentary that we hear so often about toxic masculinity, about the need for men to unlearn or relearn how to be a man and how we have to start these conversations and that men are far too competitive and they're too aggressive and too often they harm themselves and others, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, and, and it, it, it does ring true. All of the um, you know, indicators that are presented, men's sense of satisfaction in making a contribution to something larger than themselves, their satisfaction in being able to provide for their families, their enjoyment of camaraderie and, and teamwork, their enjoyment. I thought it was interesting even it mentioned that um, men in the military yes. reported very high uh, positivity um, indexes. Yes. And, uh, you know, that that, that too was, was something that uh, suggested a, a positive outlook on life. And yeah, it, it just, you know, and that is the sense one gets when, when one meets, um, meets men who are in the military, that, you know, they, their attitude is positive, that they radiate a sense of confidence, control over their lives, and well-being, which were all part of the positive mindset index. So, yeah, um, the takeaway, American men who are happy are happy because they're able to make a contribution in their workplace, they're able to look after people, they're doing something valuable in their society, uh, and uh, and as the uh, researchers concluded, um, you know this is the the greatest thing that can be done for men is to provide them with with work, good 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 work, sources yes. of work satisfaction. Yes. Well, I'd like to add something too to the military aspect you were talking about, Janice. Um, it's really interesting too. I was in the military just post Vietnam, when I would have guessed then that the general satisfaction was very low. Mm -hmm. Most of the men that we were in an age where the military was looked down on, we were embarrassed by Vietnam. Um, there was a lot of negativity and the esprit de corps just wasn't there uh, in, in the military. Uh, but now a lot of that's been restored. And so I'm, I'm wagering that that's probably very accurate, that, that, that they've reinstilled pride in, in, in the military and being a successful military and that has added to the idea of Tom was talking about of men getting reward from contributing to something great. Yes. And, yes. and that certainly would make absolute sense to me. Yeah. And the suicide data points that out <clears throat> very clearly. You know, if you look at the suicide data over the last 150 years or so, what you find is that when the suicide is high in men, it's when they can't do anything. You know, depression, when this, the Great Depression went spiked. But during the World Wars, the suicide dropped like a rock. Men had something to do. You know, they were doing something that they thought was, was contributing, something that was important. So, you know, that's a big thing. And of course, the, the reason they suggested finding good work for men was because the number one piece of men's satisfaction was their job. Their satisfaction came from their work and their employment. I thought was interesting too. Not relationships; it was their job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Although the happiest man, it did say also, but that was number five rather than number one. Was was being married or being in a committed, long term relationship? Yes. Uh, so, so certainly they stressed that that was significant too. But as you say, not as significant. As That's another one I'd really like to see the raw data. For yes. All of that. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is, of course, the, the other side of the study um, that we can't comment on based on this, this report, this summary report, is what about the men who aren't doing well? And, and, and it would be interesting to know, you know what, what the, the data is about those men, those men yes. who are not reporting a sense of satisfaction, who don't feel that they are in control of their lives, who don't feel good about themselves. Obviously, one of the things was unemployment, um, but one wonders whether uh, the researchers in their conversations with these men got at other factors as well. Yeah. Yeah, because of course, that's the thing that, you know, that, that's what struck me also reading this is that, you know, we're so focused on all of the ways in which, um, in which our society undervalues men 
and gives them the message, both in terms of you know, actual messaging and in terms of, way, of the way men are treated in our society, that men aren't valued, that men are a problem, men are mistreated in all sorts of ways, as we've talked about so often in the, in the family courts, under the law generally, in higher education, and in education generally, they, they're, they're over and over again hammered into submission by feminist accusations about their violence, about their domination of women, about their need to control and dominate and, you know, uh, be aggressive, etc. You know, and they're told over and over again that they need to be better, that they need, to, you know, masculinity needs a fundamental overhaul. And and so it's very interesting to me that we don't really see that reflected in this. No. And um, you know that that in itself is really interesting. And it is. It is. I. I about men. Think, I think the bottom line there is that men are resilient. You know, just look at what men have been through the last 50 years of being beaten down, of, you know, opening up their workplace to women, of, you know, being portrayed as the idiot on TV and in the movies, and all the male bashing that goes on in the media, <clears throat> plus the toxic masculinity stuff, blaming men <clears throat> for women's oppression, et cetera, et cetera, all that stuff. Still, men are happy. Think about it. I wonder sometimes... What would women be like if they'd gone through the same crap that men have had to go through for the last 50 years? What would they be doing right now? I would argue that women would be happier. Let me explain. Really? Oh, good. Go ahead, Paul. Well, one, one of the things that reading this, these study results happened to dawn on me, that if you go Google right now, declining happiness in women, you will have an abundance of returns of studies and opinion pieces and scholarly investigations on the fact that women, as they're, they've been given birth control choices and choices over their biological destiny and employment choices and uh, choices, you know, uh, what do I do with this child? Do I abort it? Do I have it? Do I make him pay for it? Do I not tell him? They got an abundance, just an absolute glut of choices in their life and opportunities, and they're miserable. Generally speaking, they, their happiness has declined. Yep, it's gone down. And, and the fact is, I think that speaks to some of our similarities. People, human beings, feel better when they have a purpose that's greater than themselves. They do, in general. Yeah. They're, they're happier, more content beings when they're obligated to something greater than themselves. When, when there's something more important than, what do I want this minute? We get happier as human beings. Uh, part of the, I think, the difference speaks to men's simplicity, too, not just their resilience. And this, of course, this risks getting into a stereotype of men only want one thing. But in a very true sense, if you give men a sense of purpose, something to do that where he is productive and give him somewhat semi-regular access to sex, there's not a whole lot that's going to bother him. Honestly, <laughs> people can say whatever they want to say. He doesn't care. Right. He's like not invested. He doesn't give a damn what some, you know, humanities professor in, in, in Toronto has to say about men. Well, it's like, he won't, he won't even like, what are you talking to me about this for? Right. Um, so detached would be another piece. Absolutely detached. <clears throat> that stuff, focused on what he's doing, focused on his own happiness. And what we've trained women to do is to be focused on trying to create a utopian existence for women, which is impossible and it has resulted in their misery because they can't accomplish what's, what's tried to be set up here. Men and women, shoot, two men aren't equal much less men and women. It, you're, it's, it's a really lofty ideal, but you've set them up and you give them too many choices. It's like putting a kid in a candy store and saying, everything's free. <laughs> I bet you'll come back and find a miserable child wanting something else within mm -hmm. a very short period of time, because mm -hmm. that's human nature. Yeah. So it, it's fascinating to me to see as the more men are attacked and assailed and demonized and stereotyped, they're getting happier. Uh, and I think a lot of that just has to do with their nature and women are getting miserable. Uh, well, let's so in other words, thank you, feminism. 
you've done so much for women. Let's remember too that testosterone has a certain amount of resilience built into it. Yep. So it it tells guys it's okay, you know, try again, try again, keep keep at it. It's like this is our biology. That's that's what men have. It's what what uh, Edison had. You know, he had to keep going over and over and over again, failure after failure. But boom, he kept going. You know. But I still, Paul, I still would like to see what happened to women if they were demonized like men have been demonized. Well. I, I don't think they would like it because I, I, I no think shit thinking, but, but look at it this way. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, what have women departed from that is making them miserable? Exactly. Obligated to families, mm -hmm. obligated to children. They couldn't use daycare. Uh, they had to raise children. There were more important things in their lives than them. Yes. And they were happier that yes. way. Absolutely yes. happier. Yes. And I would bet that you could probably talk trash about satisfied women who are who have lives where they're contributing to society and when they feel good about themselves you could probably trash those women out and they would be far less impacted uh, by those things than women who have little to do but to be solipsistic and obsess on mm -hmm. what they want in life yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's I a agree. really that's a fascinating uh, a really fascinating analysis and I, and I, it, I think it is so true that you know it, when if happiness is the goal and all you're thinking about is am I happy am I happy I could do this <laughs> Not being told all the time that I'm wonderful and that I can achieve all these things and it's, you don't end up feeling happy you know a lot of women feel discontented they feel you know some something's holding them back even though they're being told that nothing should hold them back and so when you have this endless narcissistic self-examination and measuring of one's you know, subjective well-being going on all the time, it's not surprising, I guess, that there's a lot of discontent. Uh, if you're not thinking about whether you're happy or not because you have something really important to do, you're going to end up feeling satisfied with your life because you feel yes. like you're, you're Bingo. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. so uh, yeah. And I think that, it, that we see that in the, in the two studies that we looked at, the one that you sent around Paul, which we'll, we'll uh, include in the link, which goes on and on about all the possible reasons why women's sense of life satisfaction is declining. And the researchers can't say, you know, they don't know. It might be because women are, are you know, you'd think that if they were comparing themselves to men, that they'd be feeling better because their prospects have improved relative to men. But maybe they're comparing themselves to other women, in which case they, their, their sense of their achievements might be diminished. And, you know, they're just speculating about all these things. And, well, maybe the women's movement has, has actually benefited men more than it's benefited <laughs> men. Well, even though they themselves admit that that can't possibly be true by any concrete measure. Um, so yeah, and yet here we see, here are men, and we know that men are struggling in all sorts of areas and face all sorts of challenges, really serious ones. And then in some ways, the prospects for men are quite grim, I would think, you know, looking at um, deaths of despair, you know, suicide, declining, you know, educational attainment, the totally unequal treatment under the law in all sorts of areas that men face. Thinking about these things, I mean, it depresses me. And I know that if I were a young man today having to listen constantly to the demeaning rhetoric, the demand that I change, the demand that I step back and make women my only priority, I'd be really angry. And yet it seems a lot of the men in this survey are either not talking about it or are brushing it off. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and, and to agree with that some more, I, I just want to make the point that I'm not at all saying that this speaks at all to the very real problems that men face. Just because men are happier in general doesn't mean that three out of four suicides aren't men. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a reality, and there's plenty of there to look at. Of course, most of the studies won't look at the real reasons. Right. Um, you get gets way too close to gynocentrism <laughs> to look at the reasons men kill themselves. So mm -hmm. it's just not done. Uh, men have harder lives. They do. The demands on them are greater. Um, and they tend to thrive in that. And some of them, unfortunately, don't. Um, 
that may just be a reality that we'll always be living with. Uh, hopefully, at least it might lend us a tendency to give men a little more compassion than we tend to and not to confuse their general happiness with everything being roses. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, because it, it sure as heck is not. And one of the things actually that, that concerned me about this study was the um, very positive representation of the fact that older men are happier. And this was interpreted, and again, we don't have the raw data, and so maybe the, the um, I think it was Martin Dobney who, who wrote this report, but he may have very good reason for phrasing it in exactly the way he did. But it said, men get happier as they get older. This is an aspirational message that can provide all men hope. With wisdom and experience comes stability and inner contentment, and a loving partner is a vital part of that. Now, I thought, well, that is a, you know, that's very encouraging, and it may well be true that as men gain wisdom, life experience, etc., they become, you know, more content in themselves and, and happier, therefore. But it also struck me that it would make sense that older men are happier in that younger men are not as happy because younger men are the ones that are really bearing the brunt of feminist man hatred. They're the ones that have gone through school from day one being told there's something wrong with them. In my generation of men, there was already quite a bit of gynocentrism and some feminism, but you know it wasn't nearly as bad as it is now. The rate of fatherlessness, of course, has massively increased over the last you know, 25 years. It's younger men that are experiencing that rather than older men. There were positive roles for men born in the 1950s and the 1960s, who are now these older men that they're talking about, whereas I don't think there are very many positive roles for men for, for a guy born in, you know, 1995. Right. Uh, so um, so I, I wondered whether inevitably men are get, are always get happier. And I don't know whether they surveyed men and said, were you, you less happy, you know, in your 20s and now you're more happy in your late 50s. Uh, I'm not sure that guys in their early 20s who are feeling you know, like the, their society has no place for them. There's nothing for them to do, nothing for them to look forward to. And all there is is blame and resentment and anger and castigation. I don't know if those guys are necessarily going to get happier with time. I hope they will. But I, I just, I wonder, I wondered why the report came to that particular conclusion and whether the report writer considered there might be other reasons why younger men are less happy than older men. If they subscribe to Regarding Men, they will be happier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. And you know, the other big piece of this is that as men get older, their testosterone goes down. And so they're less addicted to the hierarchy. And they're, they're much more detached. And man, I can tell you that for me, you know, I can enjoy life in a very different kind of way now than I could 15, 20 years ago because of that. Because I'm not, I don't feel like I have to win. I don't feel like I have to get out there, you know, I can kind of just relax and, and uh, enjoy myself. So I think that's another piece of this, that mm -hmm. why older men tend to be more uh, relaxed and, and enjoy the life in a different way, you know. And I think we are far less. I mean, if anybody thinks that feminists ever ruined my day, <laughs> they would be sadly mistaken. I mean, <laughs> there's no attachment. Uh, uh, a lot of people would think that MRAs, that active MRAs are, are very angry people. And in general, we're not in, right. by any stretch of the word. We're right. not angry at all. <laughs> Stuff is Think for yourself, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Thank you, Janice. <laughs> I try. I'm pissed <laughs> off in the morning and I'm pissed off at night when I go to bed. <laughs> all right. And as soon as I get done laughing, I'll tell you how pissed off I really am. <laughs> What's really interesting, though, is, to me, is that the comparison you look at, because when we're talking about women's unhappiness, I think feminism. I think a lot of feminist thinking yeah. leads to women's yeah. unhappiness. And I see a parallel between what I see going on between the right and left now, an absolute parallel in this. You know, when I grew up, when I was younger, a younger man in my 20s, I was a liberal, and we had fun with it. We were, were always making fun of the establishment, making fun of 
old world values and it was great and it was a big joke and we had fun. And as I got older, I became a conservative, but it's like the roles have switched. Now the left is so butthurt about everything, so serious about or the world's going to end in 12 years. And, uh, you know, because cows are farting and uh, <laughs> that's not funny. <laughs> Don't you dare laugh at that. Um, and this is the same type of seriousness I see in feminists who tend to come from the left. And I see people on the right having the fun these days and memeing and making jokes of things. That's for sure. And uh, I, to me, it's part of the same phenomena. The idea of victim mentality is something that bleeds into both of these groups that we're talking about, into women generally because of feminist indoctrination and into the left generally. Victims don't enjoy life. Yeah. They Good don't. point. Good point, Paul. And it's it's sad to see. This yeah. is, sometimes I just want to like say, say, God, you know, lighten up. Yes. <laughs> and there's a lot of victim manufacturing going on. You know. Yeah. Just that's a, for sure. Just a. Uh, How can you be happy if you think the world's against you? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it's uh, it's a very interesting. I mean, you know, in some ways, I think that that uh, it's our strength uh, in the in the men's movement that that men tend to have a very positive outlook and and uh, you know, and just not to want to dwell on things that that are wrong or things that they feel dissatisfied about or reasons to feel that society is against them. But of course, it's also the thing that makes it difficult for us to organize, you know? That, it that, is. It, yeah. uh, but part of that difficulty is because we encourage men to look in the mirror. I mean, from, from the, the grassroots level of this movement, so much of it is about you've got to look at yourself. You've got to look at your decisions, your choices. You've got to own your life. Because if you, if you don't do that, we're just going to turn into another victim ideology, mm -hmm. which you know, may be better for political clout, but it'll make men miserable. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing men will never be is a happy victim. Yeah. And um, so I think as slow and painful and arduous as the, the journey is for us, we're doing it the right way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing men will never be is a happy victim. I'm gonna quote you on that one. That's a good one, Paul. Mm -hmm. They're that just speaks, not wired for it. That speaks the truth. <clears throat> that speaks the truth. Are we about finished? I think we have some awards. Yeah. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, who gets the humanitarian? No, I think we should give it to Dr. John Barry, who is the lead author of this study. He's, uh, yeah, it's a, a wonderful thing to actually look at men, where they are, and what they as important in their own terms yes their perspective what their values are what gives them satisfaction and then to make recommendations to policy makers and you know everybody else in society about what we should be doing for men you know what where our priorities should be in relation to men according to what men say they need and want I thought that was it's brilliant you know and it's yes. amazing that, yes. that, uh, more people don't do it, but yeah, thank you. Don thank you, Barry. Dr. Barry, indeed. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Dr. Good Barry, man. very much. Yeah. A good man, and I don't mean that in a good men project sort of way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, who gets the puta? I have a suggestion for the Uh-oh. Go ahead. I would say that since generally speaking, this was a positive story about men. We didn't have an identified evil Right. feminist in right. particular, right. but I say we go with the pioneer of Putas. Ooh, and Puta Pioneers. Puta Pioneer, and that would be Gloria Steinem. Oh, Gloria who, Steinem. Yes, the, the woman who very slyly inserted herself as a playboy bunny um, <laughs> in order to study sexism. Of course, the playboy clubs are the exact model for how the whole world operates. <laughs> uh, and so she started out on the most disingenuous path possible and has been responsible for the spreading of a lot of hate yeah. over many decades. 
and she continues to do so. So, Gloria, you're our puta today. There she goes. There she goes. And hopefully she just flies the fuck out of here. (laughs) Oh, God. So we finished. I think we are for today. Mm -hmm. A positive report report for change. Oh, good. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we're doing pretty good. We're doing pretty good. Should we try it again? Yes. We can try it one more time. Men. Are. Good. All right. Y'all take care. We'll see ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.